Welcome to the Wine Access Unfiltered Podcast. It is a beautiful day to be talking about one of my favorite regions, but I think a region that maybe gets a reputation for being super fancy, only for the wealthy, but uh, it's also a region that I think has a lot of things beyond that. And we're going to talk about that today and why this is a region that you should be paying attention to, paying attention to, despite the fact that you know, I think people think of wines that are very expensive. That's not always the case. So to do that, I I haven't been to Bordeaux for like eight years. Um, I don't really, it's not my specialty as, uh, as I've talked about in the show before, but it is a reason that I love. So I brought you, which I feel like is, was maybe the right move. Um, so please welcome to the show, Aaron Pott, winemaker from Napa Valley, but also a Bordeaux winemaker as well. So you've, you've been on both sides of the pond. Yes, absolutely. And preference between them. I mean, Napa Valley got you back, which was great. Yes. I, I mean, they're both different. So, uh, I, I love Napa Valley. It's really in my blood and I love making wines here, but I, I'm always attracted to Bordeaux. It was one of my early loves in wine and I still hearken back to that early romance. I'm actually really curious to learn a little bit about what you think some of the difference are, differences are between Bordeaux and Napa Valley because they share a lot of the same varietals, but not a lot of the same other things, right? Yeah, I mean, that's so true. We, uh, we often think of Napa as being uh, an important Cabernet Sauvignon growing region. Yeah. And... Uh, also, Bordeaux is an important Cabernet Sauvignon growing region. But we don't think about Bordeaux as being uh, an important Merlot growing region, which is the most important grape variety planted there. 66% of Bordeaux is Merlot. Is that true? Yes. I didn't know yeah. that. Well, And uh, only 29.5% is Cabernet Sauvignon. So it's... Uh, it's more of a Merlot region than than anywhere else. Mm. Uh, so that, well, that's an important difference between Napa and California. We're really focused on Cabernet Sauvignon here. We have a climate that really is good at ripening Cabernet Sauvignon as yeah. well. And, uh, and that's a key difference in terms of, of ripening. We often have vintages uh, where we don't get perfect ripeness because the vintage is interrupted by heat events mm. between the time of uh, veraison when the grapes uh, change color and soften and harvest, we get these heat events that often create uh, problems with ripening. Mm. They uh, create raisining, they dry the grapes, uh, they dehydrate the grapes, and that stops the ripening process. And in Bordeaux, it's almost the exact opposite, mm. uh, that uh, they're often uh, interrupted by rain events mm. or by problems with weather. And uh, so the grapes don't get uh, enough sugar and, uh, and often don't have enough uh, alcohol to be stable wines. Yeah, which is you know also where we're getting the flavor difference for the most part, although... You know, we are looking at some vintages as of late that have been warmer in Bordeaux and sort of, you know, you look at a Bordeaux, you look at an app. I remember doing a, a tasting with the first growth not long ago. And, you know, I have to say a lot of those wines that we were tasting, like sort of tasted like a really high end Napa cab. So, yeah, and it's starting to be that way. And we're starting to see a shift in grapes uh, that they're planting in yeah. Bordeaux, uh, especially in the Medoc. People are moving away from Merlot. And planting more Cabernet Sauvignon, planting more Petit Verdot, planting more Cabernet Franc that are later ripening mm. varieties. All super interesting stuff. We're really excited to dive into it. But first, we got to talk about some things that are happening in the wine world. All right. I don't know if you've been following what's been going on in Champagne. Uh, I think for those of you out there, if, you, if you've listened to our Champagne episode, then you know there are three primary grapes of Champagne. You've got Pinot Noir, Meunier, and Chardonnay. But what you may not have known is that there's actually four other varieties that are allowed. Do you know what they are? You got me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read them because I don't actually remember them offhand. Um, I, know it's, uh, I know Pinot Gris and Pinot Blanc are in there. 
You also have Petite Meslier, you know, the, the very well-known Petite Meslier, Arban, <laughs> Pinot Blanc, and Fromanteau, which is uh, the alternate name for Pinot Gris. So those are the seven allowed varietals up until now. And I think what's really interesting is I know, um, you know, I think climate change will be a, a, a point of conversation at some point during our, our talk. But in the last few years, there has been um, a lot of push towards varietals that are more fungus resistant. Um, so one of those varietals is actually the very first hybrid varietal. It's called Voltus. And that is now the the eighth, the eighth official allowed varietal in Champagne. And our friends at Champagne Jopier have decided to be the first to plant it. Which is, sounds like a new electric car. It does sound like a new yeah. electric car. Um, have you heard of this grape before? No. Yeah, I mean, nobody has. Um, this is actually from, I don't know if it's supposed to be pronounced Peewee, but it's P-I-W-I International. Have you heard of this? This is this is all like brand new information when I was researching this. So like, bear with me. Um, Peewee. Peewee, P-I-W-I. So this is, this is basically, um, it was founded in Switzerland. And basically they're just, they're trying to figure out hybrid varietals that are, uh, just more beneficial to some of the terroirs that are in the landscapes of Europe. And so one of those varietals was Voltus. Like I said, it's fungus resistant and they're crossing a few different things here. Um, and according to their website, this is a grape that is fragrant, smooth, wide and persistent as long as the yield is limited. When the yield is high, uh, the, the must weight is weak and the acidity is high. So there you go. I mean, I don't, I don't know if that means that um, Voltus is the next big thing in Champagne, but would you try it? Yeah, I'd try anything. Yeah, I, mean, I don't think there's, there's not a lot of champagnes out there that I'm like, hey, not super into it, but I'd be excited to try it. Um, so that's what's going on. So if you see Voltus out there in the wild, if someone's like, hey, this wine is made from Voltus, it, it, it could actually come from Champagne. Sometimes we hear these other writers and like, that's not Champagne. It could come from Champagne. There's so much going on there now. It's amazing. Yeah, so much going on. They're trying to com compete with the English. <laughs> well, that's the thing, right? I mean, we see all of these other champagne houses that are looking to other places like the UK. I mean, you've even had a bunch set up shop in Oregon, here in California. Um, but I think, you know, if we're looking at long-term survival of the region, then yeah, they, they should maybe be looking at potentially other varietals, I guess. But I mean, as far as like planting of other more resistant, like, Resistant varietals, you know, is that a climate change? Is that a farming thing? Is that something that you would ever consider here in Napa? I mean, I think it's a little bit of both. You know, we have a unusual climate in Napa that it's uh, predicated on the fact that we have this fog that's created because we have the heat of the valley meeting the cold mm -hmm. water uh, of the Pacific Ocean. And that creates this fog that allows us to grow grapes here. So far, that isn't disappearing. Uh, we have had some very unusual weather this yeah. year that's a lot cooler than what we have. And we're yeah. actually behind Bordeaux this year in terms of ripening. Oh, that is interesting. Which is very unusual for huh. us. Well, there's another region that is also very behind. And unfortunately, there was some news that just broke about a week ago. I don't know if you saw um, our friends in the Finger Lakes had uh, one hell of a night uh, back in, I, I think, mid mid-May. Um, I saw it on Instagram first, uh, Christopher Bates, who's a master sommelier, um, who's always been a really big champion of the Finger Lakes region in New York. He's got his winery called Element there. I saw this post and basically they knew that there was some weather coming. They knew it was going to dip into like the low thirties. And by the time like, you know, mid, mid evening came around, it had dipped to, 27 degrees Fahrenheit lingered there for about an hour and just devastated his entire crop, which is, you know, just a shame. But unfortunately he was not the only one to suffer from, from this frost, but they are, you know, there are two weeks. Um, I think it was, it was two weeks early there was their bud break. And so it left everything susceptible, but I have to imagine like as a winemaker, when you hear these things and you own your own vineyard, um, this has to be like a terrifying thing to think about, right? Yeah, that's uh, the worst possible outcome you can imagine. Yeah. But you have to also think uh, 1961 in Bordeaux, mm -hmm. terrible frost vintage, mm -hmm. uh, but some of the greatest wines ever. Okay. Uh, so it could it could be a, a good All omen. All may not be lost. 
fingers crossed for our friends in, in the Finger Lakes, of course. And um, always a reminder, you know, buy wines from lots of different places. I mean, we love Napa wines. We love, love Bordeaux wines, but support these other regions, regions as well. They're making great wines. I'm, are you a fan of Riesling from the Finger Lakes? Yes. yes. I'm a fan of Riesling from anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I, I actually, I had one of the best experiences with the Finger Lakes Riesling not long ago. It was the Red Newt Riesling. Have mm. you had this before? No. Amazing. It was like, it was a 2016. I mean, it, it, to, it was as, as mind blowing as like a, a Grand Cru white burgundy. Like it just had like, it was singing. It was beautiful. And I just was like, you know, Riesling, it's just so wonderful. Kind of no matter where it's grown, as long as it's grown in the right place. Uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, I the last time I was in the Finger Lakes, I had a number of Cabernet Francs that were oh, absolutely yeah. fabulous. Yeah. And it's such a beautiful area. Absolutely wonderful yeah. area. Yeah, I've never been. Gorgeous. Yeah, we it looks need to beautiful. Go. I know. I'm, I'm East Coast born and bred. You'd think I would have gotten there by now, but I haven't. Um, so that is what's going on in the wine world. Very exciting stuff. I do want to talk about Cabernet Franc uh, when we get into the heart and soul of this episode about Bordeaux. But before we get there, this is my reminder to all of you, if you are listening and like this podcast and or in the YouTube format, this is your cue to like and subscribe and review this podcast. It helps us so much. We really appreciate you when you do it. Um, we are also going to be jumping into our wine club wine in just a second, which is the Chateau Pitre. Again, if you are not part of the Wine Access Unfiltered Podcast Wine Club, what are you waiting for? This is your time to drink with us and we have a lot of fun so that when when we jump back into the show, you're there with a glass ready and waiting. So all of that can be found in the description below. We're going to come right back with Aaron Pot and all things Bordeaux. All right, we are back and hopefully in your glass, like we have here, you'll have the 2020 Chateau de Pitre. I love that you stuck your nose in this immediately without really knowing much and went, Merlot, this is Merlot. <laughs> <laughs> it is a blend of Merlot, but it is mostly Merlot. There's a little Cabernet Franc in Malbec. Um, this is actually a, a direct import, so you're not gonna actually find this anywhere else in the US except for here. Um, a little bit about this wine. I, well, I think the first thing that I shared with you, Aaron, was that my dad is obsessed with this wine when I first started getting samples, um, which was sort of how I knew that this was maybe the right wine because my dad is, he's a little bit particular about what he drinks and he's not a big drinker. And so when he, he just kept going back and back and back for more, I was like, well, this is clearly a winner. Forget my palate. His is the one we should all be paying attention to. The story is, and you said her name so much nicer than I can, Nina Mitchaville? Mitchaville. Mitchaville, um, who is the owner winemaker at Chateau La. Chartreux de Boeuf. See, I knew that you would be the right person for this job. Yeah, which literally translates to Hill of the Belching Ox. And it's because it's on one of the steepest sections of uh, grade up to saint emilion up to the plateau where Chateau Trollan Mandeau is. Oh. Uh, at the top at 110 meters above the above sea level. Which you have a little experience at. I have a little experience <laughs> at, yeah. So the, before we get into the wine, the, the one thing that I didn't mention, well, fully mention, is that in addition to all the wonderful wines that Aaron makes here in Napa, you've got pot wines um, that you do with Claire and then your your two daughters. There's also hoops that you're now working on. Uh, is it Fee or F-E? I was, Fee. Fee which was wonderful, sort of a newer project on Spring Mountain. Yes, yeah, um, Lower Spring Mountain. Lower Spring Mountain that I really, really love. Uh, Blackbird, uh, former at Contessa. I mean, like all the all the properties that you're like, oh, I love this wine. Aaron is part of that. But before or sort of in between all that, because you worked at, you worked with John Kongsgaard at Kongsgaard in like... I worked with John at Newton. For or at Newton, I'm sorry. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Uh, before which, there was Kongsgaard, there was Newton. Yes, which was a great honor, a fantastic yeah. person and great winemaker and a dear friend still. Yeah. And you got to see the the creation of the unfiltered Chardonnay. Yeah. That was my first year I was hired as the white winemaker mm. uh, in 1990. And that was the first year we made the unfiltered Chardonnay. Yeah. That was kind of groundbreaking. I mean, nobody was doing that in the U.S. at that point. Yeah. I mean, it was so much fun. I mean, getting to work with John, we had amazing consultants like Dominique Lafon and mm. Michel Roland. And uh, I mean, it was a great connection to yeah. the wine world. And then it was Michel Roland that eventually got you to Bordeaux, right? Yes. Yeah. So how did that happen? I begged him uh, 
for a job. How I mean, does Aaron Pod beg? <laughs> you're like six foot four. Michelle Verland is what? I got on, I got on my knees. <laughs> no, M- Michelle was very lonely at the time. It's hard to imagine this, but uh, you know he has twenty clients uh, now in Napa, including Harlan and Screaming mm. Eagle. And uh, he only had two clients in all of California at that time, see me and Newton. Mm. And he was so bored during the time that he was here that I would invite him over for dinner. <laughs> I would uh, send him to wine tastings. I would bring friends over that had wines. Yeah. We would uh, spend a lot of time together. And one day I just worked up the courage to ask him to find me a job going back to France. In so, Bordeaux. In Bordeaux. Did you want to go specifically to Bordeaux? I would I would go anywhere that he would send me, and uh, I, I my idea was that I was just going to work as a seller guy, yeah. and maybe they would pay me, and uh, hopefully I would have some lodging there. Yeah. Uh, but he called me up. And he said, "I have the perfect job for you." That's a pretty good Michelle Roland impression. He told me that the somebody was going to pick me up at the airport, and I didn't have any idea what I was interviewing for until this I is drove like through pre-cell the phones, gates. pre-internet, pre. Yeah, yeah. I, we drove through the gates of Trollon Mondeau, and then suddenly I realized that I was interviewing for the job of winemaker. Oh, and that's different. If uh, Michel Roland says you can do it, you you can do it. <laughs> so they hired me. Well, I guess he figured if you had the confidence to ask him for a job in Bordeaux that you probably had the confidence to make the damn wine as well. Yeah. I mean, I was, uh, I was young. I was 26 years old. Wow. So it was, uh, it was an interesting experience. Six years of my life there. So you got the job. Yes. And you worked at Trouble Mondo for six years and then went to... I worked two years at Trouble Mondo okay. and then four years at La Tour Fijac. Right. Both terrible <laughs> properties that no one cares about in the wine world at all. Six years is like the, I feel like a good amount of time to really get a feel for a place. But in Bordeaux, I don't know. Is that, is that the case? I mean, these wines can take forever to age. I think people can spend the rest of their lives trying to figure out uh, a property in Bordeaux. Yeah. Especially one as complicated as Trollon Mondeau. Yeah. I mean, they're very uh, complicated geologically. And uh, so many different grape varieties, mm. so many different ages of vineyards. And, yeah. Um, so many different sites. It uh, could take a lifetime. Yeah, I bet. I mean, even in Napa, which is so much smaller than Bordeaux, although we're talking about, you know, being in one of the smaller regions of Bordeaux, I feel like Napa just has all these little pockets, right, that you can kind of get lost in. And even I've been here for almost eight years now, and I still feel like, there's roads that I turn down and I'm like, I didn't even know that was there. Like, this is all brand new information. But anyway, going, I think going back to, to this wine, we are in, uh, on the right bank of Bordeaux. So to sort of just like set the scene of where we are. And I'm, I'm sure you can chime in here about, you know, where we are in the world of France, where we are in terms of, you know, climactic differences, but you know, we're in, we're in France in the region of Bordeaux, I think confusingly, Bordeaux sort of like champagne, you know, it's sort of, it becomes this ubiquitous term where like, I just want a Bordeaux and, or Bordeaux variety wines. Um, but Bordeaux is a region first and foremost, and uh, it's a region that's sort of divided into the left and the right banks by a, an estuary that comes in off of the Atlantic Ocean. And on the left-hand side, you've got the Medoc, which we're not actually really talking very much about today, but that is where you're going to find all those really famous AOCs like Poyac and Margot and Saint Julian and um, and of course the first gross of Bordeaux, right? You can't you can't get out of a podcast in Bordeaux and not talk about the first gross of Bordeaux. But then in the other side, which I have always found to be like the slightly more interesting side, me too, yeah, <laughs> um, is the right bank of Bordeaux. And so if you think about these two different places, uh, the left bank sort of being dominated by Cabernet Sauvignon and the right bank being dominated by Cabernet Franc and Merlot. Um, I think for that reason, I, I've always just gravitated towards Cabernet Franc and, and Merlot blends. Um, but that is where you're going to find the Chateau de Pitre, uh, which is in a, a sort of a, it's not in one of the primary regions. Uh, it's not in Pomerol. It's not in saint Emilion, but it's very, very nearby. In fact, it's only a few, few kilometers east of saint Emilion. And I think one of the things that I, I want to talk about, because sort of unlike Napa Valley, not that we're trying to compare the two Um, but in Bordeaux, it really is all about the blend, right? You very rarely see single varietal wines coming out of Bordeaux, um, which I, I imagine as a winemaker, 
is really fun, right? You're, you're working with a few different varietals, but also like how important is the art of the blend in Bordeaux? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a key factor, but we also have to think that the blend comes about in Bordeaux because of the geology. Mm. And so that makes it the same as any other wine region in the world. It comes right down to the geology and uh, certain Bordeaux varieties work better on certain soils. So it sort of becomes this insurance policy, to, like in case something doesn't work out that you get to blend or is it, you know, you just have all these different tools by way of different geology. Yeah. And so, so many properties have a lot of variation in their geology mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's, that's what leads to the differences in the varieties between the left bank and the right bank. The left bank is dominated by this gravel, these gravel beds, these six gravel terraces mm -hmm. that run along the Maydock. And the, and the right bank is dominated by the limestone plateaus. Mm. Uh, so it's a totally different geology. Mm. And that, that is better. Those limestone plateaus are better for Merlot than the terraces that are better for Cabernet Sauvignon. Interesting. I know I kind of just quickly mentioned that I was more intrigued by the right bank. And I think this is where the more interesting wines are. But why do you think that is? I prefer the wines more because I love I love Merlot and Cabernet Franc as yeah. as varieties. They're more aromatic. Yeah, uh, they're more lush. They're more uh, rich. Mm -hmm. Cabernet Sauvignon is a it's a variety that takes a long time to come around, mm. and it's also it's kind of a recent phenomenon. It's uh, you know Cabernet Sauvignon makes its appearance in the Medoc. Uh, in about 1700 as a natural cross mm. between Sauvignon Blanc and Cabernet Franc. Right. And uh, so it's a more recent uh, part of the Bordeaux story. Mm -hmm. And it also comes at a time when there are all of these Dutch drainage experts that are coming into the Bordeaux estuary and right. draining some of these terraces and creating all of this new space to plant grapes. Right, because the Medoc was not the Medoc once upon a time, right? No. It was water, basically. Yes, and, and most of the vineyard was located around the city of Bordeaux. Mm. Properties like uh, Chateau Pape Clément, uh, that was the ancestral home of Pope Clément V, mm -hmm. uh, Aubryon, that was so well known by our Thomas Jefferson. Right. You know, all of those were original properties that were there for a long time that were planted to grapes yeah, uh, because they were uh, terraces that were drained. But most of the Medoc had to be drained for it to be planted to, to grapes. Yeah. There's, I mean, there's so many thing, interesting things that make Bordeaux Bordeaux. I think obviously one of them being the Medoc and the fact that it was drained and then, you know, turned into this wonderful wine region. Um, but I think the other is like this idea that it really is, it has always been, or at least in the last few hundred years, a region that is dominated by the wealthy. It's, you know, it's powerful, wealthy status. And I think even if you look at the classification systems in Bordeaux, and I'm curious your thoughts on this, because um, unlike in places like Burgundy, where the vineyards are classified, it's the properties that are classified. And you've got lots of different classification systems within Bordeaux. Um, but here we are in, in 2023, still working with the 1855 classification that Napoleon or perhaps Thomas Jefferson first uh, put together where you have the, you know, the, the first were forced fourth, first four of the first growths. Uh, and then they added the the fifth one with Mouton Rothschild. But, um, you know, here we are in, the, in 2023. Is this like still a valid thing to be doing? What do you think? Well, I mean, you know, Napoleon the third created the 1855 classification and it was based on price of mm. wines. And uh, I think that's what makes it so controversial is that it's, it was uh, the price of the wines that carried the, the classification. And it's not a classification that's based on sight. Mm. Right. I think this idea of status still very much exists in Bordeaux. But there are other wines outside of your first gross, outside of your classification systems that are very entry level. And we actually talked about uh, in a previous podcast with Vanessa and Gabrielle Dabella from Love Medicine Park, this idea that the government is now forcing a lot of these vintners to rip up their vines because there's such a surplus of wines. Um, 
what do you think the future of Bordeaux is? I mean, you've worked there, you live in Napa now, which is, you know, potentially another place that you could talk about status with. Indeed. <laughs> but, but, you know, what what do you think the future of Bordeaux is now that, you know, we have it's such an established region, but then we have a surplus of wines that are very much affordable. You have, you know, mid-level wines like the one that we're drinking today. And so even though it's a region marked by all these different things, where does that put Bordeaux 30 years from now? Well, I think what you've been seeing in Bordeaux is sort of a shrugging off of that image of mm. the the chateau, the impenetrable chateau image is changing. And I think people are becoming more, more relaxed. People are making wines that are more relaxed, I think, and making mm. wines that are more approachable. I think a lot of a lot of people have realized that their love of new barrels has gone too mm. far. And people are ratcheting back on that. People are trying new containers, clay, larger wood containers, cements. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of interest in making wines that show more of the terroir of the Bordeaux region than there ever has been before. Mm. And, uh, and I think also there are, you know, people are looking at smaller parcels. People are fermenting things separately to, to sort of see some more of the identity of these sites. And I think we're going to see some great wines coming out of Bordeaux. Yeah. I, I think we went through a period where the wines uh, were getting very ripe, very alcoholic, losing some of their freshness. And now we're returning to this period where people want to see wines that are fresher, that are more nimble, that are more interesting with food. Mm -hmm. And and I think we're returning to a, a sort of golden age of Bordeaux wine. You were, what years were you in Bordeaux? I was the there in the early 90s, yeah. Okay. So what was what was different then in the early 90s? Because I, you know, I think of early 90s Bordeaux as, as you know, still being very restrained, terroir driven. But as I, I think I alluded to earlier, that first growth Bordeaux tasting was really eye-opening. I, th I think it was pushing, you know, ripeness. They were using a ton of new French oak. So when you were there in the, in the 90s, was it more reminiscent of what you think they're stylistically moving back towards? No, I mean, in in my era, you know, you, you look at some of the wines, 1990 Trollang Mondeau, for example, fabulous wine, mm -hmm. but it's 15.5% uh, alcohol. I mean, Even very, in 1990? Very high. Interesting. Uh, and, and that sort of started the era from really 1990 to the early 2000s of these incredibly ripe, ripe wines. And now, having returned from Trollang Mandu uh, last week and seeing the new wines that they're producing there, they're much more balanced, uh, lower alcohols, uh, more acidity, more brightness. I mean, more focus on the on the terroir. Mm. Uh, they're beautiful wines, and they've built a whole new, incredible facility there. Yeah, it looks like uh, a place that aliens would build to hatch their young or something. I, I cool. actually went, I went to Triple Mundo. Um, I don't know if, when the renovations took place, but I do recall that there was a Michelin starred restaurant on property. Yeah. Two stars. Now. Two stars. Yeah. And yeah. A, a green star. So they, Sustainable. they grow all of their own food on the huh. site. It's a, it's an incredible place to go. I really, if you're in Bordeaux, I really recommend. Yeah. That's so interesting that you say that about the 15.5% alcohol in 1990. Cause I think a lot of people get hung up on this idea that like, you know, Napa is high alcohol and these wines are high alcohol. We need to go back. And I, I think I think there is merit in all of that. But it's interesting that even in 1990, that's what it was, because I don't think that in Napa, we didn't we didn't see that kind of ripeness until post 97. How was a vintner in 2023? Are they dialing that back? Because Bordeaux is not a place that I mean, it's it's not a cold place. But it's not a it's not a Napa Valley where it's easy to leave things on the vine, you know, without fear of rain or other catastrophic events. So what are they doing now to ensure that they get the ripeness, but also so that they get the restraint? What's changed? Yeah, well, that, I mean, there's certainly a lot of threat of rain. there. That's sure. the, the biggest problem. But last year they had one of their driest years ever. Hmm. And uh, I mean, the Romans came to that region and called it uh, waterland mm. <laughs> <laughs> because there was so much water there. Yeah. Uh, 
And I think people people have stopped removing as many leaves as they used to. You know, mm. people would open up the canopies so that you could uh, get more sunlight into the grapes, uh, dry them out more. And now people are leaving more leaves. Mm. They're uh, keeping their canopies uh, wider now. They're using shade cloth and, mm. and so on. So things have things have changed dramatically. I th there's more of a difference. Uh, due to climate change in Bordeaux that I see than I see in Napa Valley. Mm, that's interesting. And so so you were just there a week ago. Yes. Um, which was really just serendipitous on my part. I had no idea. <laughs> um, well done. But in terms of farming, I know, you know, there's there have been a few properties that have been quite famous for moving towards biodynamic farming, regenerative farming, I think namely Ponce Canet on the left bank of Bordeaux in, in Saint and stuff, I believe, has moved towards that 10, 15 years ago. But when you were there, were you seeing more of a push towards uh, different types of farming beyond just conventional to combat not only climate change, but also move towards this slightly different style? Well, I mean, definitely it was the very beginning of that. And I was really influenced uh, to uh, take Latour Fijac and make it into a biodynamic property. Mm, at even that in time. the 90s. So, yeah, we, okay. we started uh, the conversion of Latour Fijac with a guy, Francois Boucher, who was the consultant for Domaine de la Romane Conti, mm. and uh, started moving towards biodynamics, which was eventually achieved in 1997. Um, but there was a big movement there. And I, you know, you, you have to. When you mention all of these movements, you have to also talk about the people, uh, people like Le Puig in Côte de Franc, uh, who have been uh, using essentially biodynamic agriculture since the 1600s. Mm. So there's never been a, a chemical on the property ever. Mm. And uh, so there, are, there have been people that have always been biodynamic. And then there are a lot of people that have taken over properties uh, that were kind of underfunded mm -hmm. in the era of the 80s and 90s when uh, Roundup was being used like right. crazy. And because they were underfunded, they couldn't afford Roundup. So mm. they would just use their you know, plow and horse and whatever. And so those properties have never had any chemical agriculture on them mm. either. And that's, uh, that's astounding to think about. But there's definitely... More people are are talking about organics. More people are talking about biodynamics than ever before. I mean, it's great to hear. I don't think it's a region that we necessarily think of first. We think of those no. things. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think given the fact that when we talked about the wines being a little bit more accessible, the style may be reining back, it's good to see that there's more of a, a focus on on farming in addition to the high quality and caliber of wines that they're producing. One thing I do want to talk about, I, I want to, I actually want to go back to this wine because it keeps, it you keeps changing, it right? Here. Like it's so aromatic. I think if you, if you have this in your glass at home, you don't need to get too close to it. I mean, you can, you should, you absolutely should get in there, but it's like just jumping out of the glass. Um, Merlot, is that pretty, is that this wine? Is that Merlot? Is it the vintage? What do you, why is this jumping out this way? I mean, I think it's that, com that magic combination yeah. between Merlot and Cabernet Franc. I mean, you've got, all of the har hallmarks of Merlot, that black cherry and the, the blackberries. Mm -hmm. and, and then you have that Cabernet Franc, a little bit of cedar, tobacco. It's yeah, it's really pretty. Yeah. I mean, I like the blueberry you get as well. And floral, right? I mean, we just we just did a podcast on the Loire Valley with uh, a Chinon, right? Mm -hmm. So a Cabernet Franc that couldn't be more different than the one that's supporting in here. But you still get a little bit of that cedar, that tar, that... Mm -hmm that sort of like rose petal thing, but I, I love Merlot. And I think you mentioned in, in passing earlier about the approachability of these wines younger as compared to Cabernet Sauvignon, which can be, you know, take a long time to develop and, and evolve. But for me, Merlot is just, it's so delicious. It's like such a great weeknight wine that I think gives you all the things that you love about a, a big full bodied red wine without the intense structure of those tannins. Um, it's juicy, it's plushy, it's soft, but you know, it still has that great vibrant acidity. So it's not like, there's a great, it's not a wet blanket, a great French des descriptor for Merlot. Tell me. Le petit, le petit Jésus en culotte de velours, little Jesus in velvet underpants. I think, 
It's <laughs> <laughs> little Jesus in velvet underpants. We'll have to write that one down and put it in the description. That's great. Who came up with that, Dito? I don't know. It's <laughs> a very old one. I think you should take credit for it. Just like put it on your website. It's. I mean, it's such a great description, right? We we sometimes call Merlot like uh, Iron Fist in the Velvet Glove, um, but this one is so much better than anything I ever could have come up with. But it's delicious. You know, I think this wine um, I had over the course, I should say my dad had over the course of like three or four nights. And it, it honestly just kind of kept getting better. We kept it in fridge and um, had it with lots of different things to eat. But uh, on the food side of things, I mean, you lived in Bordeaux for six years in addition to making wine in Bordeaux. The food scene in Bordeaux, I will tell you, when I went there eight years ago, I was scared to death because <laughs> the group before me said, um, you're not going to see anything green the entire time you're there. In fact, <laughs> all of these people came back from this last trip last year and they all had gout. And I was like, oh, my God, I can't get gout. I don't know what gout is, but I'm I'm not getting it, whatever it is. <laughs> Apparently, it's because you don't eat any greens. And so I didn't even take the ch the time to Google it. I just heard no greens, going to get gout. And I was just about to move to California at that point. So I brought with me, like, all of these, like, green smoothie things. But um, I have to say, when I got to Bordeaux, the food was very rich, yes. right? Lots yeah. of Lots of very rich food. But there was actually quite a bit of produce there. Um, I think what killed me was the cheese. Uh, so tell me what it was like to live and eat in Bordeaux. Uh, wonderful, actually. I mean, it's a it's a great place to eat in France because it's it's not really known for its cuisine. Mm -hmm. But uh, the Southwest, you have uh, amazing poultry. Mm. I mean, that's without a doubt sure. one of the great things. Uh, foie gras. You have not very far away. I like that away. you went straight to Plaga <laughs> and just skipped over the chicken. <laughs> you have not very far away the Perigord truffles. Right. Uh, you have wonderful mushrooms growing in there. True. Sep, uh, so on. Uh, the Entrecote dans la Bolognaise is probably the, the most well-known uh, piece of meat mm -hmm. that you have there. But you also have this incredible river. I mean, the Gironde River. It's massive. It's one of the biggest estuaries in Europe. Mm -hmm. And so you have an incredible amount of fish in there, mm. including one of my favorites, lamprey. Uh, an lamprey? funky little eel. Okay, I was going to say, aren't, th <laughs> aren't they some, t they're kind of like the, like they're big and ugly, right? They're really ugly. Yeah. yeah it doesn't get I didn't any know anybody ate those. So uh, <laughs> there's a classic dish that uh, they have in Saint Emilion that's, a lamprey that's aged in uh, in Saint Emilion wine, and only in um, Bordeaux. I have a dear friend who has a little small property in Entre de Mer, and he makes this lamprey himself. And he has he opens up a jar every time I come, and some of them are ten years old. These things, and you. Uh, and what you, do they taste like? Oh, they're amazing. I mean, it's the softest meat you've ever tasted, and rich and uh, sweet, I mean, just delicious. salty. Uh, yeah, sa definitely savory, but with yeah. a lot of a lot of sort of almost that kind of uh, crab sweetness. Oh, that sounds yeah. delicious. Yeah, it's really good. And do you do you drink? You, I assume you drink wine with that. Yeah, well, he was the winemaker at Chateau Le Tour from uh, 1976 to no 1970. Yeah, 1975 to 1986, and so okay. uh, he has quite a collection of Le Tour. I'm sure so he does. Try to drink Latour. <laughs> I would try to drink Latour as well. That's really fortuitous for you. Yeah. Um, I guess you could drink. There is there is quite a bit of white wine, which we should talk about at some point. But in addition to the lampreys, uh, Comte cheese. Did you eat a lot of Comte? I ate a lot of Comte, but that's from the other side of the the country. The con I I I feel like when I was in Bordeaux, all we had was Comte. There's a lot of Comte, that's for sure. But, but it's, it's not from Bordeaux. Yeah, I mean that's goes back to De Gaulle's comment. You oh. know, how can you govern a country with over three hundred different kinds of cheeses? <laughs> I mean, fair. That's really interesting. I I feel like when I was there, it was I never even took the time to ask, and I just assumed that that was like the cheese of the land because literally every single meal was was ended with some sort of aged Comte. So it used to be traditionally that uh, shepherds in the Pyrenees would bring their sheep to graze mm -hmm. in the wintertime in Bordeaux. So they would, you know, take the long walk 
uh, to Bordeaux, coming all the way uh, into the the villages around mm. the town, and they would bring their cheese from the Pyrenees with them. So oh, you have that's nice. uh, sheep's cheese mainly. Okay. From that part of the world, yeah. So that, that's the, there's sort of a connection. There. All right. They well, that's would, where that's maybe that's why then. I just every, literally every meal was ended in Comte, and I still think of it as a cheese that uh, works decently with red wine. Not a lot of cheeses do, but uh, you know, Comte with whatever is left in your glass at the end of meal from a Bordeaux lunch or dinner is like you know, it's not a bad, bad way to end the meal, right? Yeah. I mean, there's so many great cheeses in France. You yeah. Could, Talk about them for the rest of time. Yeah. Basically. And if you didn't want to have red wine with your cheese, you could have white wine or even dessert wine, which is also produced in Bordeaux. Sauvignon Blanc and Semillon, both together or separate. Uh, and then also, you know, you've got your Sauternes, you've got Barsac. Uh, favorites of yours? Or do you like drinking whites from and stickies from Bordeaux? I I do like drinking them. I mean, he says with a hesitation. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I love them with cheese. I have to say that's yeah. a, that's a great combination. And then people I, I had recently, I had a, a sauterne so with a curry. Oh, and, that would be good. And it was good. Yeah. It was surprisingly good, you know, very spicy curry uh, and it's a great combination. And I, on my last visit, I was at, the Ferry Perreguet mm -hmm. uh, in Sauternes, and we uh, ate at their restaurant, mm -hmm. and they had a lot of interesting dishes that combined well with Sauternes. Huh. So recently, I someone told me they had Sauternes with oysters, raw oysters. And that's a that's a very old uh, and common thing. I had no idea. Yeah, that I yeah. can't do. That's too much for me. It feels like a lot. I mean, it feels to me like, you know, the, the foie gras and the sauterne, again, very decadent over the top. I'm not knocking anybody if that's your thing. But um, if I'm going to have sauterne, it's with cheese. You know, it's got to be with something salty. But I mean, you could do it with dessert, but it's a it's kind of dessert on its own. Right. Yeah. Like, no kidding. <laughs> it's a wildly beautiful region to visit, too. It's mm. I mean, hilly and beautiful and. Uh, and there's a lot of intriguing things to see around. It's mm. worth, worth the visit. And if you were to visit Bordeaux, I know it's a big region, but if someone came to you tomorrow and they're like, we want to go to Bordeaux, we want to experience it, where do you think you might tell them to go? Well, I think you have to see the city of Bordeaux. It's... Um, the when city's I, cool. When I lived there, it was a dump. It's nice now. <laughs> I, have, I have been there since it was redone, and it, it is beautiful. And it's great. And there's a great museum, La Cité du Vin, mm -hmm. uh, in Bordeaux that's a fabulous place to start. Yeah. And uh, you have to see that. But I think for me, where my passion lies is saint emilion It's such yeah. a charming city. Yeah. And so beautiful, beautiful little village. You have to spend time there. And yeah, and yeah so it is gorgeous. It is really beautiful. It reminded me of being like uh, in in Beauty and the Beast or something. Like it just had that like, bonjour, bonjour. Like it just kind of <laughs> had that sort of provincial feel. But what was really, I thought was really cool about Cinti Million was um, all of the wine shops. There's so many, I've, at least I remember, there were so many little like corner wine shops that you'd like go in and then you go down some stairs, there was like more wine. You go down some more stairs, and there was more wine. And it was like dirt cheap. And we were like, I mean, I was in my 20s just starting out in wine. And I was like, I can get these like wines from the 80s from Bordeaux for like 20 euro. It was like nothing. Still the same. Yeah. And yeah, it was. Nothing's changed. It was, I think there's a hundred wine shops in town. So. Right. It's. I mean, there's <laughs> so many of them. Um, and it was, to me, it was just one of the the best experiences I'd ha I've ever had in a French or even European city. So I'm with you. I think saint Emilion, And then also you can go to Triple Angwendo, which is like right there. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And go have a two Michelin starred meal, which was delicious. And I still think of with fond, fond memories. Yeah. Um, absolutely beautiful place too. Do you feel like you need to f speak French to go to Bordeaux? Uh, no, I don't, I don't, no. I don't think you do. I mean, I think so many French people speak English these days. And I, I don't think you need to speak French to, to have a great experience there. It definitely helps. Yeah. I mean, How get, good is your French? Uh, Pretty good? Very good, yeah. yeah. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's taken me a long time. <laughs> but, yeah, it's, I mean, I went to school there. Yeah. Oh, that's true. Live there. So uh, it's, it's very good. And I, I really, I, I love the language and I love the country and I try to keep it up. And it's, yeah. um, 
it takes a lot of work. Yeah. Do you miss it? Do you ever feel like you want to go back and make wine there? Uh, I, you know, so much of what I love about France uh, has come to the United States. Mm. You know, so much of the food culture mm. that I loved um, has come here. And yeah. I, I, and I, I really, I'm an American. I, I love Napa Valley. I love Napa Valley wines. I love the people. I yeah. love the food. I love the tomatoes in the summer. <laughs> I, I love everything Tomatoes about it. Uh, you know, my, my wife could not have the garden that she has in, in France. And uh, we couldn't have the life that we have. Here. Yeah. So I really, I love America. Yeah. I'm, I, that's interesting you say that because I think we, I had a similar revelation when I was in Europe recently and I kind of, I thought about Napa when I was there and I was like, you know, everything's kind of there now. I mean, not everything, but a lot of things are there. Um, and it is still, it's so beautiful to visit these regions. And I think Bordeaux, if you're a wine lover, it has to be on your list. I mean, it, it is such a beautiful region that's, you know, it's so over the top, right? It's these big chateaus and beautifully manicured lawns. And there's not a, a whisper of rusticity on the left bank and, there's definitely a little bit on the right bank, but, you know, I think if you want that feel of pomp and circumstance, which I think is a good thing sometimes, you can definitely have that in Bordeaux. And then you can go to other parts where it feels a little bit more charming and relaxed, like in, in saint Emilion. So um, the world is sort of your oyster. The wines are delicious. You can have reds, you can have whites, you can have sweet wines. Um, I, I hear they're quite welcoming of champagne as well. I think every, every meal we started, which was really interesting because you don't often go to a lot of wine regions where they serve wines from other places, but I don't know, maybe Bordeaux is just like, we're so comfortable in what we do that like, yeah, we can throw a little champagne in here too. It used to not be that way. No. It used to be just Bordeaux and you had to, <laughs> you had to get out of there to find something else. Yeah. But, but now, yeah, it's, it's a lot more open and it yeah. seems to be a real world wine city. Yeah. It seems like a city of bon vivants, you know, and I know, I know Burgundy and, and Dijon is, is certainly that as well, but at least like, I remember going to a dinner at Ducru Bocayou, Bruno Bori hosted. And it was just this like very over the top affair in this man's kitchen with everything that you could have imagined. And it was just so like, eh, this is just what we do. This is, you know, escargot and the best Timoni Birico that you'll ever have. And it was, it was such a, a celebration of wine and food that it really, it made me think about wine and food in a very different way, but it also, um, it felt so right in, in that region. And I have such fond memories of, of that night in particular, but just of all the food and wine experiences that I had there, cause it is quite grand sometimes. Yeah. It's very grand. I mean, especially a chateau like Du Cru Boca, you yes. know, with a beautiful view of the yes. Gironde and yeah. fabulous spot. Yeah. I think you can visit. I mean, I think both of us have probably had some unique experiences, you more so than I in Bordeaux, but it is very much a place that you can visit. Someone recently said, I think it was John Scupney on our recent podcast. He said, uh, Bordeaux, you can you can buy the wine, but you can't taste it. And Burgundy, you can taste the wine, but you can't buy it or something like that. <laughs> it's exactly that. Um, so I th it, it is a little strange. Like no one's going to slide out there. Well, maybe they will in Bordeaux, but no one's going to slide you like a bunch of um, a bunch of tasting glasses. You're not going to taste through all the wines that they make if you visit, which... You know, you're not going to taste that half barrel of the Montrachet. Every year. It's not going to, it's not going to happen. So yeah, I think, you know, just sort of taper your expectations. If you go to Bordeaux, it's going to be a slightly different experience than in Napa, but there's also beautiful hotels. There's beautiful restaurants that are, you know, on the property. So I think there's some amazing experiences to be had. Um, plan early. Plan and, early. Yeah. Okay. Plan very early and uh, make sure you have all your plans in place and that you confirm them over and over again. Okay. Things That's good get tip. lost and forgotten there. Interesting. Very easily. So reservations required. Reservations this is not required. A... And the first answer you're always going to get is ce n'est pas possible. It's not possible. Is, it's not possible. But it is possible. So keep <laughs> be, be persistent. Persistence pays off. Making your reservations early. Uh, yeah, you can't really go to Bordeaux on a whim. You definitely have to like have a plan in place. You're going to be driving lots of different places as well. Make some time for the city of Bordeaux, which is really just charming. Try not to do it in July like I did and bike all over the city on a 105 degree day. It was a great story, but it was disgusting in practice. Um, 
and have fun. You know, drink lots of great wine. Uh, and if you you don't find yourself in Bordeaux and you do find yourself here in Napa, uh, where can people find you? Uh, potwine.com. Yeah. You sell out all your wine, so it's not like, yeah. for the most part. We always loved your wines at, at press. They're the favorites of ours. And especially of Jody. She, I think she was your biggest fan. Oh, Jojo. We definitely, we definitely would have had your wines in the list, but we definitely had extra because of because of Jody just selling them out left and right. Please can we get some more? I love being able to talk with winemakers, and more importantly, I love being able to talk about things that you don't normally maybe get to talk about on podcasts, which is yeah, uh, fun. Yeah, Bordeaux, a favorite region of of both of ours, and a place I hope to get back to soon. So. Speaking of which, I will let you get back to all of the things that you're doing, and uh, I'll cheers you until we get to see each other at Bottle Rock this weekend. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Thank you. This has been the Wine Access Unfiltered Podcast. I'm your host, Amanda McCrossin. We will see you next time. Cheers. Cheers.